Good afternoon or good morning if you're joining us from the Americas and thanks for joining us for the next hour or so for this, the latest in OEG's uh, series of webinars looking at the state of the aviation industry in this very strange year. I'm Becca Rowland, a partner at Midas Aviation and I'll be the host for today. Um, if you're in the US um, or indeed anywhere else, uh, we hope to give you an hour's distraction away from the news. Um, as usual, we'll be drawing on OEG data to help you understand what's happening. And today we'll be taking a particular look at the impact and implications for the tourism and hospitality sector. According to some, travel and tourism accounted for over 10% of global GDP, or at least they did uh, last year. And we know the business of flying and the tourism sector are really closely related. So the difficulties we're seeing now in aviation are mirrored across tourism and hospitality and the solutions to get people flying again will require all of us to work together. And so um, it's really good to have Louise Finnegan join us this afternoon. Louise is the head of business partnership at Tourism Ireland and will be sharing some of her uh, wisdom and knowledge from that particular market, helping us understand perhaps what, uh, what we all need to do to, to help recovery. Uh, so welcome, Louise. Thank you very much, Becca. And I gather you've been uh, you've been up part of the night listening to uh, the US news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm mainlining caffeine here now at the moment, uh, so I hope I'm still <laughs> making sense. Story. But uh, yeah, pretty compelling viewing. The popcorn was out last night. <laughs> and we've also got John Grant with us from OEG, who, as ever, will be giving his interpretation of the data and helping us understand what that all means for us. So let's um, start by looking some at some of the data we usually start with. Um, and uh, that's uh, what we're going to look at. So, yeah, um, we start here, John, often, don't we? Just this is uh, colour coded countries, the capacity, uh, airline capacity this week versus the same week last year. Um, we are slowly moving towards that beige colour, aren't we, rather than just straight red. Uh, if we compared this to four months ago, it is a bit better, isn't it? Uh, yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it couldn't have got any worse, really, Becca, could it? So, you know, we, we can only head in one direction, but we have slowly been seeing some shifting and some change. Um, and, you know, we've commented many times about uh, China and particularly the Chinese domestic market. But there are some other points where uh, we're moving from blood red to um, perhaps better shades of um, pink. Uh, Latin America has um, seen some international markets opening in the last couple of weeks um, and in Africa uh, we've seen some uplifting capacity in markets such as South Africa but but in general you know we're still um, sitting in a pretty depressed situation um, just um, 55.6 million seats pretty much half of what we saw this time last year um, and with no real confidence or optimism about seeing an improvement, um, certainly this side of uh, Christmas and early 2021. So it's, uh, it's but you, you could be saying I told you so, couldn't you? We've been hearing something similar from you for quite a while now. Um, and, and as we, you know, we'll be looking at how capacity has been coming down. But um, I think you said some months ago that we probably would end the year at 50 million seats, something like that, didn't you? I did, but um, you know, it's not something I'm proud of. I'd much rather have been caught um, completely uh, wrong and seen a rapid recovery. But um, the writing has been on the cards for a long time in terms of capacity and market sentiment. And you know, you just from where the airline industry is looking at the moment and its subsequent impact on tourism, hospitality, and everything that Louise will share with us later. It's um, it's tough times for everyone. And as we work our way through these slides, if you're listening and you've got questions for John or for Louise, then do use the uh, the questions area to send them in and we'll have some time at the end, hopefully, for answering those questions. But we will aim to answer some of them as we go through as well. So this is another set of data that's uh, familiar. We've been tracking this for some time now. Uh, this is showing the percentages of uh, airline um, flights this week or this month versus the same time last year and um, we've got the numbers by region at the top and and a chart below we see a little dip again this week in europe there's some um, europe trickling along at the bottom here we we saw a move up i guess that was half term in 
in Europe, was it, John? And then yeah. now we've come um, out the other side of half term. We did, um, and just to trick or treat us on Saturday evening, of course, um, the UK government has imposed a lockdown from tomorrow, um, and international travel is ostensibly uh, banned or um, has to be for essential reasons. So um, we had scheduled this week somewhere like, I think it was about 690,000 international seats departing from the United Kingdom. Um, and I would expect up to 70% of those to have disappeared by this time next week. So, you know, that that will drag down further, but not just the UK, but obviously um, tourism markets like the Canary Isles, where we'd seen a sudden uptake in bookings um, when the government had given the all clear to travel there less than 10 days before the announced lockdown. So it must be desperately desperately frustrating to be a hotelier, tour operator, tourism board who's trying to second guess um, quite frankly bizarre decision making, um, almost impossible. But it's, it's you know, it, it, it is what it is and we have to live with it. Um, there have been some, as I say, some, some interesting other pieces of um, capacity growth, Latin America, Peru and Argentina, open to um, more international uh, services um, and that's that's obviously great news and in a in a slightly bizarre way um, North America and specifically the United States has seen um, American and Southwest add quite a lot of capacity in the last couple of weeks despite the fact that the CARES Act has expired and they're not currently um, receiving any support or um, government assistance in terms of uh, subsidized services or or being able to run those services so we are just you know it sometimes you see some numbers that just seem out of sync with the market sentiment and what's happening in the world but as a network planner and having having undertaken that role myself you know you are you you are at the mercy of these decisions and you're second guessing them and you see a sudden shift in bookings and you fill yourself with optimism and you put more capacity in and then suddenly you you see that that was just a very a very soft change in the market and um, you need to recalibrate your capacity. Now we've uh, seen a number of airlines haven't we make what seem to be um, strange decisions where they've added capacity where it doesn't really look as if there's underlying demand um, you know, is it opportunistic or um, wishful well, thinking, I suppose? I mean, you know, um, and one of the greatest um, carriers in terms of performing and operating through the whole COVID-19 event has been Wizz Air um, in Europe. And at the moment, um, you know, their October performance was a 66% load factor, which, which is it, it's quite good. But for a low cost airline, you know, you've got to be hitting those 85, 90 percent load factors to be profitable. So there's a lot of airlines who are still flying around with a lot of um, a lot of cash draining out of their businesses. And I know we have some interesting slides on that a bit later in the uh, analysis. Yeah, so it's strange times when some of the airlines are, are boasting that they've got their their cash burn down to 20 million dollars a day, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's something to be admired. <laughs> so we've um, you spoke at the beginning here about the UK in particular, where you know we're in the UK now and we're going into lockdown tomorrow. But but across Northern Europe, we we're seeing COVID cases rise. We're seeing Germany, France introduce more restrictions. It's the Northern Hemisphere in North America. Uh, North America is obviously in the Northern Hemisphere and potentially going into sort of winter when we might see COVID rise again. And they're, they're protected a bit more by being a you know, large domestic markets we've talked about before. What, what about some of the markets further south, Mexico, Brazil? We've had a question about, about yeah. Brazil. It seems there that leisure traffic's quite strong. And I know that you and I talked this last week about Mexico um, being quite strong as well. Is that is that just because they're in the southern hemisphere and COVID is is in abeyance a little bit more at the moment, or is it um, um, that they're large Mexico, domestic markets? Yeah, Mexico stayed open throughout, stayed open um, in inverted commas throughout uh, the first spike and round of COVID nineteen. Um, so it became a discretion discretionary choice of the traveller whether they wish to to fly or not, and many elected to continue flying. 
Um, and whereas Brazil did have a degree of lockdown, um, you know, the government um, was quite strong in their view that um, this is only a flu-like um, condition uh, and there's nothing to worry about. Um, and um, people have continued to travel and airlines have continued to operate, particularly domestically. Both of those markets were early pioneers of low cost um, air services in Latin America. And both of those mar markets saw a huge and significant migration away from uh, bus and coach operations to uh, low cost airlines. Now, even though you might think that sitting in an aircraft is, you know, a bit of a risk at the moment, although the evidence suggests it's not, and you know, all the science supports that as well. Um, it's still a safer bet than sitting in a in a coach that's going to take 36 hours to get you from Mexico City to Cancun, for example. That's um, a really interesting so, observation. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, it, it still it still has its place in the market and in and in the total transport modal mix. Interesting. So we'll move on. Um, this is a slightly different slide for, for those of you who uh, joined us in previous uh, webinars. We've shown a sort of heat map like this, but we've typically done it by country. What we're showing you this time is um, country pairs. So the top 20 country pairs for capacity last year. Um, and on the left hand side, we've, we've got the ranking, uh, but we've grouped them by sort of global regions. So broadly, we can see these top country pairs that are in Asia, much more closed markets, um, capacity down uh, much more strongly than, than elsewhere. And, and we have November and December in here, but obviously that's not capacity that's flown yet. That's, um, that's scheduled and may or may not happen, but we'll, we'll come to that. Um, in Europe, a um, bit more yellow and a little bit more green in there. Um, Canada and Mexico, Canada, the Canada-US border, um, not a lot of travel happening there, not a lot of flying, but Mexico-US doing very well. Um, John, is there anything here we need to be looking at in particular? Well, this, this um, when you begin to look by country level, there's a lot more interesting insights, I think. You know, you can see um, to the point we were making earlier, um, the Mexico-US capacity has returned quite strongly in the last four or five months um, uh, to the point where uh, I know both uh, US Cancun and US um, uh, US traffic to um, some of the uh, California, Mexico destinations um, are is actually stronger and bookings are ahead of last year. Um, but that has come at a price and, and the yields, as, as we'll see a bit later again, are, are much softer than they have been in previous years. Um, but I think, you know, for a lot of airlines, um, and the UK, US is just one example. Um, the need to reopen connectivity on the transatlantic market um, and begin to get some scale back into those operations is vitally important to the airlines. It is a, it's an extremely lucrative part of most um, US major and European major airline business models, and they need that back as quickly as possible. And you can see how, you know, just looking at another point, you can see how quickly a lockdown um, has an impact um, on capacity when you look at some of the European markets and you see how, how things have changed from September um, into October. Uh, it's, you know, it's suddenly not looking as good as it was perhaps six or seven weeks ago. And this is obviously capacity. It's not even traffic, is it? The traffic is, a, is, is, is well be below this, isn't it? Yeah, where, I mean, where we, we tend to be trending with capacity, uh, with traffic anywhere between 15 and 20 percentage points down on uh, the capacity point as well. So, you know, I, the whole argument about keeping the middle seat free, free and using it as a marketing gimmick or a marketing message um, still isn't valid because most flights are probably flying with no more than 50 percent load factors. OK, so the um, the. As, as I said earlier, the November and December numbers here, um, some of them look a bit optimistic, places like Germany, Turkey coming down to minus 34.6% um, in December. But, you know, we've said all along, we think that more capacity is going to come out of the market. And this is a slide we've updated to show um, this thick, uh, thickest yellow line here is the latest capacity, the schedule that we're seeing 
through to the end of the year. And you can see from different points, snapshots in time um, from the OEG database, just where the capacity was scheduled previously, the grey line being last year, and it's just come out and come out and come out. And so, you know, there's a whole chunk of capacity come out since we last did this webinar. And if we were to extend this trend down that we've had since um, mid-July, we will be ending the year on, on the sort of 50 million point, won't we, John? We will, and I, I think this goes to um, the very heart of the challenge we still have both for the airlines, the airports, and um, destination marketing organizations generally. There is so much capacity being placed into the market that is just not going to be operated come the day of travel. So we're actually creating a false um, position in terms of optimism about capacity and subsequently frustrating travelers who are perhaps looking to book um, three, maybe four weeks before travel, uh, in some cases, to find that the flight has subsequently been cancelled. And when airlines are making these short last minute changes, which is you know, entirely understandable, given the situation they face at the moment, do they really understand the implications on the broader confidence factor that is rippling through the leisure and the VFR traveller? Would you would you want to book a flight for three or four weeks time and have a 30 percent chance of that flight being cancelled or rescheduled, which is what the global average is at this moment in time and being left with a Ryanair refund voucher to be used at another date, which is convenient for you um, and in fact, even more convenient for Ryanair. Um, you know, there's better ways to spend your money when um, you're going into a lockdown period. So it's a very, very frustrating situation. And um, I think we're looking at circa 51, maybe 52 million seats per week mm -hmm. by the end of um, December, which would be less than half um, of the levels we were at um, at the end of 2019. 2020 yeah. has been an absolutely horrible year for the aviation and tourism industry. Very difficult, isn't it? We wanted to take a look at what some in, in airlines in particular um, in Europe, were how they were responding in terms of capacity. So each of these, these are three of our large um, low cost airlines in Europe. And we've looked at the capacity they had scheduled a month ago and then this week. So it's weekly, a week of capacity. Um, and we're showing the capacity all the way through uh, the, the fourth quarter, so through from the beginning of October to the end of December. We see how it's changed with the, the yellow line um, being what we're seeing now in the schedule. Interesting, isn't it? Wizz Air appears to have taken, they've taken out a lot of capacity. So almost done what you'd, you'd wanted, they or what you were suggesting airlines should be doing, they should be taking it out, and now they're, they're adding it back in. Whereas what we're seeing at Ryanair and EasyJet is the opposite, they're, they're taking it out, aren't they, John? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think from a pragmatic perspective and maybe even a more cautious sort of airline revenue management perspective is publish your core program that you know you will operate and then add additional sectors and capacity in response to what you're seeing the market um, do and behave rather than flood the market with seats and then see if there is any uptake or interest in that capacity. But but it's it's the absolute scale of the numbers as well when it, when you just look at this. I mean, to comprehend that EasyJet have taken out approximately 1.2 million seats a week uh, in the space of a month just tells you um, how how fluid and how flexible the situation is, and of course how airlines are trying to preserve cash. Yeah. So when we look at the um some of the legacy carriers, we've got Lufthansa, KLM, Air France, British Airways here, slightly different picture. It, it looks at first glance like they're, they're not adjusting their schedules as much. So is that that they're being unrealistic or is that that they are genuinely planning to operate a bit more capacity? Um, uh, a, a bit of both, I think. It's much harder for these carriers as well because of the complexity of their networks um, and the reliance on connecting traffic. You know, you can't, it's not quite so easy for these airlines to begin to cut back without um, 
almost creating that sort of deck of cards scenario where you pull one away and then another one comes and then another one comes and and you ended up with a stranded network and stranded capacity. Um, so so these airlines are are slightly um, are having to behave slightly differently, um, and you know that that clearly um, is difficult for them and it's difficult for the customers and um, they have even more concerns about short-term lockdowns and sudden changes in travel policies but if you you know the standout there again is British Airways I don't know you know I know it's a new chief executive um, and he may have more optimism than many others um, and you know quite why he thinks we commence in the 23rd of November he's going to see capacity increase from about 220 to 620,000 seats in the space of a week. Um, clearly, uh, I think it, it shows more to the point that they're just planning three weeks ahead, doesn't it, John? Yeah, exactly. There's 400,000 seats to come out, and why don't you take them out now, guys, rather than just leave them there for three more weeks? So it's been a pretty hard um, time, obviously, for the airlines. And the last since we've last done a webinar, we've had a number of airlines report their. Uh, financial results for the third quarter. Uh, we've got uh, ones we could find here. We know there's a few more airlines to report in the next week or so. Um, some staggering losses here, aren't they, given that some of these, especially the American carriers, United, American, Delta, these were the carriers that accounted for the largest proportion of profit globally in the industry in the last few years. And um, between this list of carriers here, uh, We've seen losses of over $17 billion um, in a quarter. Quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah, staggering. Um, and, you know, from, from many measurement and analytical sort of perspectives, these were companies and are companies that have been regarded as the best managed airlines in the world. Um, and the losses are, are immense and staggering um, in what is traditionally one of the, the strongest quarters of the year for the airline industry, a, a good mix of leisure and in September business and corporate demand returning. Um, and in absolute terms, you know, this is these are large percentages of their revenue and, and their capital. Um, but perhaps the bigger worry is, is not these airlines because I think all of these are long-term survivors um, and will be in play for the next 10, 12 years, perhaps in some shape or form. Um, but it's that those that are of a smaller scale than these, um, the mid market, um, not particularly um, scalable carriers um, who have a high dependency on a on a national market or a high um, you know proportion of their uh, operation is is supported by governments and other such shareholders who are going to find the next five or six months really difficult, Becca. And and today we have. 761 airlines who filed scheduled services this week um, and we've lost 10 percent of airlines who scheduled services in january and it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect us to see another 10 percent of scheduled airlines uh, disappearing in the next five or six months um, and many will just we won't even really notice they have disappeared um, because you know they they are increasingly marginalized and with a small percentage share uh, so, so expect some more damage and disappointment, I think. And and the other interesting thing here is China Southern, who I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yesterday announced um, that their third quarter had been profitable, um, and that's great. Um, but one percent of their capacity is now allocated to international services, so that th third quarter result is entirely based around Chinese domestic services and their cargo operations which have continued to fly now for an airline the size of china southern you know that level of profitability the roi on their network um is just is dire it's it's not it's not sustainable in the long term um if the fuel price was to move probably no more than three or four percentage points that would wipe out china southern's profitability um which perhaps ask two questions that we we need to think about as an industry um first is chinese international service or scheduled services from chinese airlines will they come back in the way we see them operating before 
Um, will they be operating those ultra long haul scheduled services from tier two cities in China to tier two cities in Western Europe? Probably not. They were they were not profitable before COVID-19. And, and more importantly, um, will we see consolidation in, in the Chinese airline industry? Um, you know, it's quite fragmented. Um, the big three are very big and very successful, but the others, um, although indirectly supported by the government, are struggling to survive. Very interesting. Um, let's, let's move on. One of the questions we've asked ourselves um, with the level of of state support that some of these airlines have had is whether that's affecting the decisions they make about how much capacity to operate. And I guess we were specifically wondering, are, in Europe, are the likes of Lufthansa, Air France, KLM, are they perhaps putting out more capacity than we might expect because there's less to lose in a sense because there's there's more government support. So we, we put this chart together which shows the top 50 airlines um, the grey are the ones where we haven't um, actually allocated whether they've received support or not, but the blue are those where we know they've received some sort of support. Um, and, and we just plot the capacity this winter versus last winter. Now we know that some of the capacity for this winter will, will be reduced, but essentially those falling below the dotted line are planning to operate less capacity and those above are planning to operate more. So it's no surprise that these three that sit above the line are the Chinese carriers and these four here are the four US carriers. It's not really showing us any distortion at the moment, is it, John, as a result of the support that has been offered so far? No, not really. And, you know, it comes back to what we were saying um, earlier um, in, in the year and in the pandemic event, when the first tranche of support funding was provided to many airlines, um, it created an uneven playing field. Um, and allowed those carriers to perhaps operate more capacity than otherwise would be the case or be in a position where when a recovery did occur, they were able to, to grow back um, more quickly than others. Um, and whilst, whilst many carriers have taken, you know, quite a cautious approach to their capacity, um, we haven't seen, the. it goes back to that whole point, we haven't seen the levels of capacity being cut that we probably should see. To, to have the most um, efficient and effective winter uh, operating program. You know, there is just too much, too much, too many seats slushing around in the market um, that is encouraging low fares. And um, ultimately, although it generates some cash, um, probably isn't profitable operational flying for many of these airlines. And it does feel, well, we're going to move on to tourism and hospitality now, but it does feel like actually having those seats operating isn't the answer to recovery of people flying, that, that what's needed is, is something to do with COVID, it's to do with testing, and it's to do with vaccines and, and so on. Um, so this is World Travel and Tourism um, Council data that for last year that just shows the travel and tourism as a percentage of GDP. And I've picked out a handful of um, European and, and America's countries here. So globally, uh, travel and tourism accounted for 10.3% 10, 10 of GDP. Um, Louise, Ireland's down a bit under 5% here. So it's not it's not the biggest earner for Ireland, but but in your role, obviously it is, a, travel and tourism is a very important um, part of, of what you're doing and it is important for Ireland. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, that 5% probably, I suspect, a bit understated, to be quite honest with you. I mean, that's driven by about, this is uh, Republic of Ireland figures here, but by about 9.6 million visitors that we saw last year. Um, and it's a huge, huge impact um, in, in terms of, of the contribution to the economy and, and uh, the contribution it makes to overall standards of living here, I suppose, in general. But um, Becky, if you just want to flip on to the first slide, I, I think maybe if I just get stuck into to some of the and, things. And you should about. point out you are responsible for the, the whole of Ireland, aren't you? It's not just. Yeah. Ireland. So it's a. We are a little different. We're slightly unusual, I suppose, as an organisation. So Tourism Ireland is responsible for the marketing of the island of Ireland overseas. So we actually have two. Um, political jurisdictions, really, the Republic of Ireland 
and also Northern Ireland. And our remit, born out of the Good Friday Agreement actually, is to promote the entire entirety of Ireland overseas and market the island of Ireland overseas. So actually, what we don't do is, is work towards the domestic product. We don't work directly with industry in terms of developing the product on the ground. We're fortunate that we have uh, two very uh, efficient organizations and sister agencies that really do focus on that. But our job is really the overseas market and to promote both Ireland, both North and South. And, and Northern Ireland has a very particular call out in the activity we do. Um, and so the slides that, that I have here, uh, really, I suppose, just since the beginning of this whole pandemic situation for us and the first lockdown that we saw in March, we've always said that the solution here or the road to recovery involves this sort of three-legged stool or three-piece puzzle. Uh, the first part, I suppose, is access. You know, we're an island hanging off the western seaboard or the western coast of Europe. Um, <clears throat> In total, uh, last year, we saw about 11.2 million tourists to the entire or the full island of Ireland. And, you know, I, I don't need to tell you guys the impact of COVID-19 and the access picture on uh, on how that's impacted Ireland. I mean, access has fallen off a cliff. Last summer, we were seeing uh, over 600,000, about 617,000, I think, weekly one-way seats uh, into the island of Ireland. And that has really just fallen over. And that's that's really important for us. It's a real challenge for us um, because of the challenges associated with getting tourists, obviously, to an island. And the vast, vast, vast majority of visitors and tourists that we see here uh, do obviously travel by air. And I'm not going to, to, to sort of flog that one. I think you guys know the access picture better than everybody else. But, you know, clearly it's fundamental and vitally important that we begin to regain that access, that we begin to build that back up that capacity as quickly as possible and support uh, those routes coming back and the pack capacity coming in. So I suppose the second leg of the stool is the product availability, and that's crucial for us. Uh, it's, it's about, and when I talk about product availability, I'm talking about uh, the accommodation sector, the transport sector, attractions, experiences, and hospitalities. And they're all in a fight for survival at the moment. Um, our, as I said, we have some tremendous local or domestic agencies, sister agencies, and they're really, really good. And they've been a great, doing a great job at supporting that local industry. That's going to be vital in terms of attracting overseas demand and attracting visitors going forward. And there's been a lot going on in that area. And I can't um, overstate that really uh, from major promotional campaigns and staycation campaigns in terms of trying to support the domestic industry to more practical things like grant support schemes, uh, adaptation funds. So all of the stuff that goes into making sure that facilities are COVID safe, whether it's hand sanitizers or screens and all of that good stuff that, that everybody will be familiar with. Um, information and training has been really important to support the industry. That's training about managing cash flow or staff management and how to access uh, other government supports down to things like counseling and counseling and the, and the support services that can be offered to industry. And then underlying that, I suppose, is the range of government schemes and job support programs that are in place as well. So that's all really important to try and support the industry in surviving and making sure they're going to be uh, there when we can welcome visitors back again, that we're going to get through these lean months and this, this very tough winter that is going to be ahead of us now. We had a great summer in terms of domestic travel, but that's never going to be enough really to make up for the lack and the loss of overseas visitors. So we are continuing to support the industry we, as, as best we can. Uh, throughout this this crisis and I suppose then the the other key element and the third leg of the stool is the consumer sentiment and, and motivation so not just what they're feeling but but how consumers might act and we've been doing a lot of research and a lot of uh, analysis on this since really since the very start of this and since April May and, and that includes monthly trackers and deep dives focus groups and we've been doing that across about 11 markets uh, and talking to people who've taken holidays in recent years or planning on taking holidays in, in the very near future, ABC1s, typically kind of C2s maybe in GB. And really we wanted to understand what the impact of COVID-19 is on their decision making, uh, what their 2020 holiday experience was like and the impact that that has on their decision making and what their comfort level in traveling would be and, and how all of that would affect their future travel plans. So those three areas really coming together as we see it um, in terms of informing a, a future path to recovery 
uh, and how we might eventually get past and over this crisis. Um, so do you want to go on to the next slide there? Yeah, Beth, I, I, I guess the consumer motivation that you're talking about is, is just as relevant, isn't it, for the airlines? Oh, it's that huge. That piece of information they need to understand just as much as, as you do. Yeah, and and this I mean this slide sort of speaks to to some of that, and some of what we're seeing is that although domestic vacationing across uh, EU and, and and GB in particular really kind of scratched an itch, and travellers want to, to to travel, they're still very hesitant about future planning. And John, I think you referenced this earlier on in terms of um, shortening the booking window, and we're definitely seeing that. And and through our research, that's that's definitely come to the fore. Uh, spontaneity is coming to the fore much rather than longer term planning. So where booking windows might have been six to eight weeks, they're now, as you said, down to closer to about three weeks. And uh, that came through very strongly in some of our focus groups. You could see a quote there: "It's better to spend a bit more and wait. We could book last minute." And know that we're and know that we're going uh, but it's better to be spontaneous about it and that really does speak to people's just hesitancy about making too many commitments they're willing to take the hit in their pocket uh, rather than make the commitment and then be not sure and not be sure that they'll actually be able to to take the trip um, also what we're seeing is a, is a desire for greater independence and flexibility quote there we're hopeful we can get away in 21 but we don't want to book anything yet it took five months to get our money back from Ryanair so we'll wait until next March or April, May and, and book a last minute uh, trip. And that speaks to, to people's desire, I think, for control uh, and to be more in control to a certain extent of their own destinies. And more than ever, I think we've seen people now, given the, the, the recent past, far more conscious of paying attention to terms and conditions, booking policies, cancellation policies. Uh, and, and from our, one of our focus groups there, I'd book a trip if I knew I'd be able to get 100% refund or if we could find an insurance company that could provide an insurance uh, solid insurance policy. So all of that really speaks to that sort of shorter booking uh, window and the hesitancy about making commitments now when there is so much unknown. And, and Becca, we, I said this to you, I think, earlier on, if there's one thing we can be sure of and can guarantee at the moment, it's uncertainty and that, that is likely to continue for a while. It Louise. feels to me that what you're saying from, from this, that especially the comments about the, the refunds and the, the Ryanair comment there, you, you know, many of us struggle to get refunds um, from trips that were cancelled this summer. And and the, the airlines, you know, I hate to say it, but they really haven't helped themselves, have they, in, in what's happened there? That some of what we're seeing now is 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 hesitancy from the consumer, from the traveller, simply because of a bad experience that they had before. Yeah, and you know, People judge based on the experience they've had. And, and I will say, I wouldn't lay the blame for this all at the feet of the airlines by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, we've seen this with tour operators who have struggled to maintain cash flow. You know, they've paid out upfront on commitments um, and then all of a sudden have to turn around and try and um, um, give money back to consumers or to people who have booked. So it is right across the industry this has happened uh, from hotels uh, across the board. Uh, but certainly in Ireland, we've been very conscious of working with industry to, to make sure that they're working with their consumers and with their customers to try and support them. So actually what we've seen and what hotels have seen in a large instance here is rebooking into next year as opposed to, to full on cancellations. Yeah. John, were you going to uh, chip in yeah, with a question? Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting. It's, it's almost like an elasticity of com consumer confidence that is... Uh -huh. you know, it is, a, if, you, if you imagine, um, you know, it is about that elasticity. The further away I go from my home, then the, yeah. the greater that elasticity is stretched. Um, and it just, it just ends up in a situation where people refocus back into domestic and regional travel. Um, and, you know, for many airlines, the whole concept of having to um, refund so much cash in... Mm -hmm. March, April and May was just completely beyond them because their cash reserves at that time of the year are at their lowest point. You know, they have they've seen their, their way through January and February in the first half of March. They've burnt quite a bit of cash continuing to operate. And at that time of the year, every tourism board, every airline is expecting to begin to see an uptick in activity. Um, and of course, it, it didn't happen. So they weren't even able to use cash in the bank to to refund those that had booked for July and August because the cash was was draining out too quickly. Mm. And we've, you know, you're absolutely spot on. And 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 I suppose, in from our perspective, 
uh, here on the island of Ireland. That's been compounded to a large extent by the fact that we have had a restriction uh, in terms of inbound visitors. Um, there's been pretty much no significant markets that uh, haven't had to or we haven't imposed um, uh, quarantines or self-isolation for two weeks upon arrival and essential is, is now guided as essential travel only, or sorry, travel is guided now as essential travel only. So, you know, we really haven't seen any overseas tourists uh, since probably early March and, and that's really put a strain not only on the airlines but obviously on the whole industry here. And um, you said before also, that you're working to the, the traffic light system that's operating in the EU. Do you want to say a bit about that and how that works? Um, yeah, so it's 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 theoretically, I think, pretty straightforward. It's it's you know red, green, amber, green being no restrictions, and that is applied where um, countries have a an infection rate, rolling 14 day, I think, infection rate of 25 per 100,000. Um, and that's fine. And countries that, that fall into that category, then uh, people can travel freely between them. The challenge, I suppose, with that is, and then, sorry, as you go through orange, there's a certain level of restriction and, and testing involved. If the uh, infection rate increases a little bit more, there's some tweaks to that. And then red is is pretty much lockdown, which is where most of Europe really is at the moment. But, you know, when we've when we've dug a little deeper into that and we have a wonderful strategy and insights team in our in our depart in our organization here, and they've really teased this out to look and see, you know, in our major markets, what does that look like? When could we expect to see visitors and when can we expect to see infection rates drop back down into that 25 per 100,000 level um, in terms of uh, potential to travel? And what we're seeing is if you look back at the first peak, typically markets are taking anything between four up to maybe about six weeks before or after that peak uh, before they got back down to that, that green light level. So in the, the situation we're in now, um, probably I would expect to see another four weeks before uh, we're seeing numbers drop down into to levels into those green levels where there could be free free movement between markets or between destinations. So let's move on. You've got another slide to uh, that, that yes. looks about the changes in destination choice. Yeah, so really what we wanted to do was get a sense of, well, well, what's driving, what's informing people's destination or choice of destination? And what was coming across very clearly was holiday makers are being influenced by both emotional needs and emotional drivers, things like trips with a purpose, visiting VF4, visiting fan, friends uh, and relations, special occasions like weddings and events or family reunions, and also sort of the bucket list stuff, a desire to catch up on maybe things they missed out over the last year. So there's still those emotional drivers there that are that are uh, steering people towards wanting to travel and wanting to travel overseas again but that's very much tempered by the requirement and the need to be in control and uh, that's come through very clearly in a few different areas so mode of transport would be a key thing and flying we're seeing has a kind of mixed appeal uh, train car or ferry uh, really represents greater control for people and I think that's control is, is not just about it's not just about safety per se, it's not about safety on an airplane uh, per se, it's it's just as much or even more about having the flexibility to, to, to say, well, the situa situation has changed, I can jump in my car, I don't have to rebook, I don't have to look at other alternatives, and I, I'm a master or mistress of my own fate to a certain extent. So that mode of transport um, really is critical in terms of supporting people in their decision making, uh, and, and clearly that means that if a car is uh, preferable to flying than access within uh, a certain amount or a certain distance and road distance uh, from from people's point of origin is is going to be a key factor and then i think john you maybe mentioned the elasticity before and this last point sort of speaks to that known and close locations are increasingly or we've seen are increasingly important uh, known in terms of the familiarity people who have been here before for example in ireland who know the lie of the land who know how to get around who know what to expect uh, you know fam familiarity doesn't breed contempt in this instance it's a good thing it's a positive thing Thing. And then obviously the point you made about uh, elasticity, the closer people are to home, the more secure and safer they feel. So potentially short haul, certainly point to point trips, I think uh, we're going to see as, as being key in recovery as well. well what will that, do, do you have any sense yet of what that will mean for you going forward? I mean, I assume that the largest international market prior to this was uh, Great Britain and then it would have been neighbouring European countries anyway and, and the long haul stuff you know we we 
talked over the, you know, John and I have talked over the last few years about the long haul travel from China into Europe and, you know, lots of airports looking to get a Chinese service. But, but I take it that sort of stuff was actually quite small for you. So as you think about the future, how does your sort of destination marketing and your sense of what are the key origin markets change going forward? Yeah, so by volume, certainly um, GB, Great Britain, is is our biggest market. That's by volume of visitors. By value, it's actually the US. Um, though we, we wouldn't get as many visitors from the US, they're worth more. They stay longer, they spend more. So by value, that's that's really our most important market. And that's that uh, poses a huge difficulty for us, obviously. Uh, generally, uh, the profile of those visitors is so sometimes a little bit older. They're coming back um, to you know maybe they've they've roots in Ireland and they're they're coming to explore that so the US market we think probably is going to take a little bit longer to recover for us uh, then potentially GB, which is a near neighbor and then near European markets. So yeah, um, and I suppose if you want to flick on to the next slide there, Beck, I can talk to that in terms of where we see opportunities. And it really will vary by market. I mean, typically our target market would be um, what we would call the, the culturally curious visitor. And they are really... Um, the folks that want to get under the skin a little bit more, they want they want to do more than scratch the surface. They want to have a full experience. They want to really and um, get to know the the local environment and and you know understand it better. And that's going to be that that's been the the target market that we've gone after and pretty much across all of our markets. But I think we'll be focusing initially certainly on those nearer markets uh, and probably our potentially a younger co younger cohort as well. Um, that younger demographic we've seen is probably more likely to travel sooner um, than an older visitor. I mean, I think that's that's fairly intuitive. Um, as I said, familiarity is a key area as well that's important for folks. So previous visitors will also be a key target market for us. So repeat visitors from the GB for, from uh, Great Britain, for example, will be an important market and we will actively and proactive, uh, proactively go after that segment. And we've mentioned uh, VF4, not not a segment we would particularly target or have targeted in the past uh, simply because they don't actually spend as much they tend to often stay with friends and family um, but they do signal and they're a good signaler I mean there's a certain sense out there of people wanting to dip a toe in the in the water to see what the experience is like but they don't want it necessarily to be their own toe so we can see VFO <laughs> playing a, an important role there and then some of the niche areas like um, golf luxury have in the past been sort of at the um, the the forefront and the vanguard of, of recoveries we've seen in the past. So, you know, as I said earlier on, a lot of uncertainty still, and we've certainly got an uphill battle um, in terms of of cracking this egg. But going back, I suppose to my very first slide, you know, it's a virtuous cycle. We need the product to be there, we need sentiment to be in our favour, and we need the access to be there as well. Louise, That's really I helpful. Louise, I can't believe that you have just profiled my demographic so well. <laughs> what younger, John? Is it? <laughs> Every one of them, I tick the box. I'm, I'm, I just can't believe I'm, I'm buying my ticket with Ryanair right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, bringing all of that together, um, what do we need to do to get people travelling again? One of the things that we've we've talked about, not not so much for a few months now, but but travel corridors. We saw a few weeks ago the UK announce um, that travel to the Canary Islands would be possible. Um, we've seen various ups and downs with UK Spain corridor, which we've, you know, is the, is, is the largest international travel market. So we had a look here at how capacities changed and tried to overlay that with um, some of the um, restrictions on travel for the UK Spain market. And we're not really seeing any effect here, are we, John? I know this morning we did a webinar this morning to more into Asia. We looked at um, some of Singapore's um, travel corridors that they're putting in place. But again, we saw we saw no impact at all on travel from opening up some of those corridors. Is we talk a lot about you know what governments need to do, how do we open things up, but but corridors don't seem to be working for us, do they? Corridors air bridges bubbles you know in green lanes green lanes whatever you want to call them in april and may were clutching at straws when we were looking for any hope um but the reality is you know it is 
it is just such a marginal element of the need to rescale the business and to get capacity out there and people flying again that they just do not work and in many cases they have been nothing more than hollow political sound bites that people have made um, and in many cases they've still not even been implemented becca one of the one of the great things in singapore is i think they have about eight or nine travel agreements in process now none of them none of them are actually operating the much touted hong kong singapore corridor leisure air bridge whatever it happens to be is still at least two or three weeks away and you know airlines aren't in a position where they're going to put any more capacity or any more flights on um, when they're sitting with 45 50 60 percent load factors they don't need to um, until we find a way to successfully test at airports or before you reach the airport and track and trace and we have universal acceptance of those requirements by governments all around the world rather than piecemeal unilateral policies and um, directives that we can't understand we are we are grounded it is just far too confusing and risky for a traveller to invest in a, in a flight even to Italy from the United Kingdom. Uh, so, yeah. you know, they are they are extremely frustrating. And I mean, you know, it goes back to the first question we had today that was uh, from Bernard Lavelle. Um, Bernard and I used to work a few years ago um, at London City and he asked, um, why, why do you think we're seeing a lack of leadership from various governments within the EU on testing? and indeed around the world and the, the, quite frankly Bernard the answer is I don't know and I wish I did know um, because it's holding us back uh, as an industry and it's extremely frustrating for everyone I think airline CEOs uh, ultimately tourism boards everyone it's just so frustrating I, I guess this plays to what Louise was saying that you know the heart of it all is uncertainty and the the current testing um, regime or use of quarantines or the imposition of restrictions and the lifting of restrictions is actually adding to the uncertainty rather than solving a problem there, isn't it? So in, in the space of eight days at London Heathrow, we had a big announcement that um, testing was available at London Heathrow, um, but that testing protocol is only currently accepted um, by the Italian and Hong Kong governments. So unless you were going to fly to one of those two destinations, then you know it was it was a bit of a hollow statement, but it was a step forward, and we need to make those steps forwards. Five days later, United Airlines announced that they are going to be doing free testing for travellers on their Newark um, Heathrow services for a one-month period. Four days later, um, and the UK government announces a lockdown. Um, it, you just couldn't write the story really and if you did you know you'd have to put it in a comic with bubbles for speech marks because it's so funny. I wanted to give us just a slightly more positive uh, perspective um, we don't often we, we're usually talking about capacity but uh, I don't say so much about traffic just because of the lag in, in the time to get the data but uh, the US um, uh, transport screening services um, report very very timely data about how many people are being screened at US airports which is a, a good if not, if not perfect proxy for for passenger traffic and um, this is the latest data um, from just a few days ago and it's still moving up um, they are day by day screening more and more passengers and in fact on the 18th of October they screened over a million passengers for the first time since March and if we carry on on this way we, we are looking at sort of getting to about 43% of where they were a year ago. I suppose that's still lower than our 50, you know, half, half of capacity. So maybe we're at half capacity and 43% of traffic, but, but that is the US, which is a large domestic market, isn't it, John? But there's a little yeah. bit of hope there. Traffic is moving up if we look at this. Absolutely, and they're probably all currently trying to buy, buy a seat to somewhere like Wisconsin or somewhere where they're still counted, <laughs> but try and change the decision. Um, but you know that's that's a piece of short termism. If it's a positive trend, but we are, you know, Becca, we are clutching at straws, really. Um, you know, that we are. 40, we're trying to we're trying very hard to find something positive to we say. Are. And that forty that forty three percent is completely predicated on domestic, essentially domestic uh, capacity and domestic passenger numbers. Yes, there are some to the Caribbean, 
places such as Aruba and Curacao and other such points and you know there is traffic to Mexico but um, it's it, until you get international capacity back into the North American and the US market um, it, it's probably going to start to plateau out again at about that 43 maybe 50 percent over Thanksgiving weekend and perhaps a few days before Christmas. Uh, we've got one more slide from the states. Um, last week the um, Bureau of Transportation Statistics um, produced an analysis on airfares. Um, so the yellow line here is their um, average fares in constant uh, 2020 dollars and um, the uh, grey line is in current dollars. So really we're looking at the yellow line here and, and basically they're showing that airfares simply haven't been this low in a very long time. Um, so I guess that's that's good news for the consumer. It's not great for, for the airlines, is it? That there, there is more traffic we're seeing, there's more capacity, um, but actually the fares are, are really not great. No, it's it's a buyer's market, um, and that's what you would expect, you know, in normal revenue management conditions. Lots of excess capacity, um, trying to stimulate demand, um, and you you end up in this situation where the fares are coming down to this point. Uh, I think, you know, if there's one thing you can say about that, at least the operating cost for those airlines that are operating are at some of the lowest levels we've we've ever seen with the prices of oil. Um, and many airlines are now at a point where their fuel hedges are beginning to run down, so they're they're paying the spot price rather than having paid the the inflated price um, that they had purchased into probably 12 months ago when they thought the market would be very different. Um, so there are bargains to be had out there, um, and you know the really scary piece of this is these are bargains to be had at two or three weeks' notice when typically an airline is um, closing down its lower yielded booking classes and beginning to increase fares quite significantly uh, in line with expected business demand. The, the trouble it seems is just finding the um, the reasons to to give people to travel to to say actually okay I'm going to do it I'm going to um, book something for a few weeks time um, and I'm going to have a go. Um, it, it, it just that that uncertainty is is just too too much in the background in our thinking, isn't it? It is for many people. You know, I book my holidays for next year. And I think everyone's just got to be brave and bold and and mm -hmm. and go with you know the hope that the, there is going to be an uptick and vaccines will be found. Um, and there is so much pent out demand. We've seen it when these corridors and these bubbles and those restrictions have been lifted. Some markets have seen rapid booking activity, the amount of bookings that were made from the UK to the Canary Isles um, when the Canary Isles were put back on the green list for 10 days was was just an indication of how much demand there is. is Louise, is that is that something you have a sense of, of whether there is pent up demand? Um, yeah, no, that's certainly de something that, that, that we are seeing and, and certainly through the research that we've taken, um, I think over the next I believe the figure was over the next 12 months the there's a, in our top four markets which would be uk or gb um the us germany and france nine out of ten of those polled are expected to take an overseas trip in the next 12 months so definitely the demand is there um and and while we can't welcome visitors at the moment we're very active in the marketplace now with a sort of dream now travel later message uh, to try and stay top of mind and that's that's the big challenge that we have at the moment is maintaining that i suppose share of a voice a share of mind really uh, and staying forefront of people's consideration that's really good we've just got one minute left have i got any final thoughts from either of you on on this area of of travel tourism hospitality uh, what are the key takeaways um, oh, I think... for me go on louise please go first Sorry, John. Uh, really, what I was going to say is, and uh, from I suppose a very uh, tourism Ireland perspective, we're we're really trying to plan for all, all uh, scenarios and and coming out of the, the traps. What's going to be very important is a reassurance message that people feel reassured that they can travel or when they can travel that it will be safe, uh, and we'll be combining that sort of awareness with come visit Ireland, fantastic places. We tick all the boxes and what visitors will be looking for 
uh, and what research is telling us in terms of uh, wide open spaces, green spaces, outdoor activities, adventures, uh, but balancing that with a tactical sort of book now type message as well. So lots still to play for. And, and uh, despite the uncertainty, as I said, Brecca, you know, shifting sands and moving goalposts. So uh, a, a lot going on out there. It sounds like you've got John's, uh, John, John's booking a holiday to Ireland. No, my, <laughs> my, my demography fits the bill perfectly, but I mean, Perfect. you know, it, it is about being flexible in your planning and mm. being creative um, and that reassurance message. But, but, you know, I sit here and I sort of think, as a marketeer, this is a fantastic opportunity if you get the timing right and you get the messaging right to create some really inspirational um, campaigns and tourism projects. Um, so it is, it is just, just get over this, what seems to be this last hurdle um, over the last bit of the wall that Donald's trying to build today. And you know, once you've done that, I think be ready, get set, and um, tourism will recover. Great. I think we've done well not to uh, not to talk about the US election really at all today. Um, thank you both very much indeed. Thanks, Louise, for joining us and for all your insights into uh, tourism and hospitality. And thanks, as always, John. Please do head over to the OEG website if you're not already getting John's weekly blog, then you can sign up for that. And uh, do have a look at the recovery tracker that OEG puts out every uh, Monday to, that, that just keeps you up to date with what's happening with aviation capacity as we move through this period. Um, I think that's all for now. So thank you very much for joining us again. And uh, we'll be back on the uh, Wednesday, the 9th of December, I believe. So. Uh, come and uh, join us then. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.